has spoken to us before um, on uh, locating and repairing faults on submarine cables and then on the first hundred years of wireless at sea. This time it sounds an interesting talk and I'm looking forward to hearing it if only to understand what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> because when it first came through, it was one of these, occasionally we get it, these lectures which mean an awful lot to those in the know and mean absolutely nothing to the rest of us. So I'm quite looking forward to that. He's obviously got a checkered career and he's going to tell us about it himself. Because looking down his list of qualifications, I don't know where he's come from or how he's arrived here. So over to you, John. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, good evening and thanks for asking me to speak again. My background is a bit odd. I left school with four O levels, and I'm sure people in the audience of an age which know what an O level was. I only got four of them at my father's expense, and I went to Mullard's to do an engineering apprenticeship, electronic engineering apprenticeship. At the time I went to, uh, that I left school, I couldn't stand the sight of blood. Uh, to the extent that if I was walking past the hospital, I'd cross the road <laughs> and walk away from it. Uh, but at the end of the apprenticeship, the only thing left, only uh, jobs left within the Phillips group um, were in the medical division. And I ended up um, working for Phillips Medical um, in the X-ray uh, uh, world. Um, <clears throat> after a while, I realised that blood under control was not so bad after all. And about four years later, Phillips uh, wanted to put me on the management scheme, um, which I'm sure a lot of you know means you stop engineering and start pen pushing. Um, <coughs> so I actually bolted and went and read medicine. Uh, Phillips were very good about it. Um, and because I wasn't going to the competition, I knew I could give them a year's notice. Um, and they were very good and actually gave me back job and a car when I had university um, vacations <clears throat> in the first three years. But I ended up um, qualifying and um, ended up as an anaesthetist. And I've only recently seen, I could, I've never seen the goldfish there before. Um, I shouldn't have been an anaesthetist because I can't do crosswords. Um, and it's always assumed that um, that's what anaesthetists do. In fact, uh, from a slight advertising point of view, the most senior, most qualified person, uh, certainly out of hours and the weekends, um, are anaesthetists. We, were, we are actually medically qualified um, and, I, and actually ran 90% of all intensive care units. So I think a little bit of a side thing. Uh, let's get on with what we're, what we're going to talk about. Um, reverse engineering um, <clears throat> is sometimes called back engineering. It's the process in which uh, software, machines, aircraft, architectural structures and other products are demonstrated, uh, deconstructed uh, to extract design information from them. That's what the dictionary says. Um, and very simply, I suppose I'm bad to put it this way, it's um, easiest it, uh, demonstrated in what's been going on for donkey's years um, in anatomy and physiology, um, trying to understand uh, the function. But to get strictly back to uh, engineering as engineering, um, <coughs> what's the motivation for reverse engineering? Well, there are a number of uh, sensible, um, suitable motivations and some that are not so, uh, not so honest. Um, it may be to uh, interface pieces of equipment. You've got to find out how the pieces of equipment can be interfaced um, if all the documentation has disappeared. Um, improving the documentation, uh, replacing obsolete components, uh, product security analysis, bug fixing, and just plain academic and learning purposes. And also to uh, see if such a piece of equipment can be repurposed, which may save money. Another interesting thing um, is uh, forensically uh, things being taken apart to see how they worked and also how they went wrong. 
then there's a slightly um, more immoral and unethical motivations, um, which are basically uh, espionage, which could be industrial or military. And I'll come into certainly the military one a bit later on. Um, <clears throat> the creation of unlicensed and unapproved duplicates and competitive technical intelligence. Um, but all these are a little bit on the dubious side as far as motivation is concerned. You know, it can be, <coughs> can be hardware um, that is being reversed, um, mainly hardware, which could be either civil, mechanical, electrical, electronic, and, or software. And I'm not going to talk much about software. Um, other words for it, uh, for reverse engineering software are hacking. It's done by geeks and nerds, and maybe there's somebody in the audience who enjoys uh, reverse engineering of software. And there is the question uh, whether it's immoral, unethical, uh, or even illegal uh, espionage. It seems that it's a very interesting thing um, that uh, people are interested in software engineering. Uh, because if you compare the number of published works there are on reverse engineering, uh, called reverse engineering, and yet when you open them, um, they're purely to do with software um, hacking. Um, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in print, and you think there'd be something interesting from a hardware point of view, uh, but there isn't. Um, it, all of these are to do with hacking software or firmware. Uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest ones actually, which is free of charge as a PDF, over 900 pages of it. Um, and it's available free of charge. And guess where it comes from? Uh, Russia, <laughs> who are absolute experts at um, all forms of reverse engineering, as I'll come to. There are a few um, books which are, do cover more hardware than software, um, of which uh, there, these are a few, and I'm afraid there aren't many that are that brilliant, um, or I didn't find them that brilliant to read as, as a subject, um, except for uh, this one, which is absolutely brilliant um, and is available, but uh, try and find it um, from a second-hand um, shop, if you can, because it's eighty pounds worth, uh, but it is absolutely first class. It's gone quite good. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. But, uh, Anyway, another book that I've recently found, which is uh, very interesting, is this one, which was published a couple of years ago, which is about uh, forensic engineering, but it is in fact all about basically reverse engineering and then trying to find out why uh, failure occurred. <clears throat> so I'll go, I'm going to give some examples. Um, in fact, most of the rest of my talk is about examples. Um, they're either for mainly for academic or archaeological purposes. Um, the three that I want to talk about uh, first are ancient ones. Um, the Antikythera me mechanism, the Baghdad battery, and uh, Stevenson's rocket. Now, the, this one, which is the Antikythera mechanism, very strange. In 1900, um, a fisherman, actually it was a sponge divers, found um, chunks of stuff on the ground, on the uh, sea near in the Antikythera era, era area um, of Greece. Um, <clears throat> when it was, uh, they fortunately, he, they collected carefully uh, sponge divers as much as they could find. And over the next hundred years, um, all sorts of things were done to try and find out what it was, um, including x-raying it, um, x-raying all the pieces. And it must be just purely, really, for um, academic purposes. Um, but it was just, they found out that it was probably in the era of 60 BC, 
that this um, mechanism had been lost overboard, probably when a ship was sunk in that area. And over the years, um, people have discovered uh, what, how it actually worked and what it actually does. And it's um, basically a device for showing the positions of uh, various uh, bodies in the um, galaxy. Um, and this is a sort of section that they have how they worked out as it was how it worked. Um, and they press the and this here um, is a perspex model. Um, transparent model of the mechanism, um, which they showed did actually um, work in a similar way to a planetarium, really. Um, if anybody is interested in looking deep, more deeply into it, um, there's this book, which is, is quite academic. It was published by uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to read how um, the, this how they discover what the mechanism did um, and, and made a model to make it work. Another odd one was this so-called Baghdad battery. Um, Baghdad, because that's where it was discovered, and there are several of them stored there in a museum, um, but uh, they disappeared um, over the, uh, the war, the, rec the more recent war. Um, and a lot of people wonder what it was for. Um, and in this, this chat found, uh, made some idea of what it was for, um, what it, how it worked, uh, but he, he still not quite sure what it was for. Um, it was suggested that it was between the era of 150 BC and 223 AD, but still it, it when you see the construction of it, it would work as a single cell battery. Um, but they were all stolen, the several examples were, were stolen during the war and nobody, one is supposed to be, although I wouldn't like to be quoted, of course, um, owned by Mr. Bezos, um, who recently was the head of Amazon. Um, the possibilities are that it was a primary cell, uh, which they, because they could feel um, the electrical current that was produced by it, and it could have been either used for electroplating or, and, as in um, the, a lot of the uh, electrical acupuncture devices nowadays, um, it could have been used for uh, pain relief. But then somebody has recently suggested that it was a scroll jar, but how you can store scrolls in that, um, goodness only knows. <clears throat> the third rather ancient one that I'd like to mention uh, was recently spoken about by Michael Bailey in the um, meeting down of the Newcomer Society down in London a few months ago. Um, and this is a superb report, if you can get if you can, you, it's still available, I managed to buy one from via Amazon. Um, it's a report about the history of um, Stevenson's rocket. And as you can see on there, um, the, there are tracings of the way it was and where it is now. It's a very good um, report. And the key thing um, that, uh, it, that, told, that it told me about um, at the meeting uh, was that you should go through all the literature and search it first before tearing something apart to see how it worked. Um, and as you can see, uh, these two uh, images come from that book. Um, initially, uh, <coughs> the uh, cylinder was like this, and now it's like this. And the book uh, goes through all the various stages um, <coughs> of it. Um, there was even a stage uh, which uh, they could only tell really uh, by actually tearing the thing, taking the thing apart to see how it worked. Uh, that at one stage, this Lord Donald, Don, Donald um, he put uh, took the cylinders off it 
um, and you can see this is crossways here and put in one a rotary steam engine like this here and the way you could tell that it possibly was done is where the steam coming out of the boiler um, had a central outlet which had been blocked off of the a central outlet for the steam which had been blocked off rather than the two side outlets going to the two cylinders one either side you don't hear much about it when it was like this because it was put, put back correctly uh, without um, this rotary device and with back with the two cylinders uh, <coughs> and uh, worked again this system did not work in the rocket but uh, this full story is told in that report in a very good way <coughs> Now, to go into um, some of the military ones, which are, I think, more interesting, but um, it's up to you. Um, two ancient ones, which there's not much about in the literature, uh, were the Egypt an Egyptian chariot and a Carthaginian quinquireme, which is a, a rowing a battleship. <coughs> but the ones I'm going to talk about are <coughs> more recent than that. Um, from World War II, and they're mainly to do with um, electronics. And the first one isn't. Um, we, you probably all recognise that as being uh, a jerry can, and jerry cans were used in the Second World War to enormous effect by uh, both sides, but it was a direct copy um, of the German can um, which even to the, uh, the uh, mechanism up here, uh, the cap mechanism. And it was so brilliant that the, the, the West, the, uh, the Brits and the Americans copied it absolutely. Um, and you may wonder why it was, uh, been, why it was so successful. Uh, well, it's simple as this. Um, if you're a strong man, um, you could carry it like that, but if you were two weaker men or two women, you could carry it like that. So simple, but um, it's a direct reverse engineering copy um, of the, the German uh, device. <coughs> right, now that is a picture of the uh, British Embassy in Oslo. And you might wonder what that's all about. Well, a German named Hans, Dr. Hans Ferdinand Mayer, who was a mathematician um, and a physicist, an academic, um, wrote a report. Uh, he was obviously not a friend of the Nazis, but he, because he sent this via anonymously via um, the British Embassy uh, of things that were going on in Germany. Um, surprisingly, he actually survived the war and died in 1980. But uh, the two... Uh, the uh, Oslo report was fairly quickly passed on to this gentleman called Reginald Jones, um, who was a physicist, a um, young physicist at the age of 24 and was, uh, di did a lot of research uh, for the government. Um, can you notice anything odd about him? Uh, this, that's as he was at war in the wartime and here he is um, just before he died actually uh, when he was a uh, professor of physics in Aberdeen. Anything odd? He's got two wristwatches on. Um, <laughs> why? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but anyway, he was sent uh, this uh, Oslo report, uh, a translated version of it into English, all, all very, very secret. Um, <clears throat> he was sent it, and the two bits that interested him, the JU-88, they, they were, these are just the titles of, it was a seven page long, plus diagrams in this Oslo report. 
Uh, JU-88, you must have heard of anyway, it was uh, Junkers, Ilkers uh, bomber. The Franken was uh, going to be uh, a very big aircraft carrier. And there was other bits about an autopilot, a remote control projectiles, um, including gliders. Um, <clears throat> can't remember what the reckoning was, but, and methods of attack on bunkers. Uh, but the two key things that um, interested R.V. Jones were aero warning equipment and uh, range finders, RO range finders. There were also bits about torpedoes, new torpedoes, and electric fuses for bombs and shells. Now, the naval people in the UK thought this was all too good to be true, and was... Set, uh, was um, they put it uh, aside, but R.V. Jones um, picked up on it um, and worked hard on it. Now, one of the reasons um, he got excited about it was that um, there was in uh, Cockfosters uh, in London, North London, <coughs> uh, the place here called uh, Trent Hall. And Trent Hall was where all senior German officers um, from generals downwards <coughs> and even um, senior um, Luftwaffe pilots were taken to be interrogated before um, they were shunted off to other prisoner of war camps. The, gen the generals uh, all ended up staying the whole like, wartime there. But what the special thing about uh, Trent Park um, is that it was bugged. Everything was bugged. Even the trees in the garden were bugged. Um, and there were interrogation rooms, which were obviously recorded as well. And there were wire recorders and people listening very carefully in the basement of Trent Park. And throughout the war, none of this lot um, realized that they were being recorded. Um, <clears throat> and on one occasion, um, that they, they were interrogating a um, senior pilot, or two of them, at two separate times. Um, but they went back to their rooms, these two pilots, to, that they were sharing a room. And one of them referred to Nicobine, um, and the other one said, they'll never find it. Well, this was red rag to a bull, especially to R.V. Jones. Um, so he uh, wanted to, he thought it must be something electronic um, that they were able to, uh, that it was going to help them bomb the right places or the wrong places, as far as we were concerned. Um, so he went um, and uh, he, he knew one of the chief interrogators, a chap called Felkin, um, who was an expert interrogator, no, no, no uh, nasty work done, it was just pure interrogation. And he asked Felkin, uh, R.V. Jones asked Felkin to find out what on earth it could be that was in the planes. And the only thing that he could think of was um, a blind landing receiver, which were in all the planes anyway. Um, and they worked by, um, if you must have seen this sort of thing before, um, it was mainly for blind landing. So the transmitters will be at this end here, sending out one send stream of sent out dots, and the other side sent out dashes. And when you're in the midline here, you, the two were just, it was just a continuous note. Um, but they thought at first this couldn't be uh, used for that for that uh, purpose of blind bombing, um, and uh, Jones asked Felkin to find out um, where, where the people who are analysing the, the receivers, because they managed to find one of these receivers, um, which unfortunately, uh, due to squabbling, a plane had landed on the beach and um, in the south along the south coast. Um, and the Navy wanted it, um, and the um, RAF and Army wanted it to send it off to be uh, taken apart uh, to find out what was going on. Um, and because they were f in fighting, 
Um, it got flooded a couple of times uh, because of the one moment it was on the beach and land and the next minute it was in the water. Anyway, um, <coughs> Harvey Jones thought it must be to do with this blind landing receiver and he asked the people the, who were taking it apart, um, is there anything special about the blind landing receiver? And they said, no, not really, except it is very much more power uh, sensitive than uh, a normal blind landing receiver. Um, and so R.V. Jones thought, well, we've got to find where it was. It must be beams coming across doing it. Um, and they must be, we must try and find these beams. And there's, there's a long story about uh, it even ended up with um, Churchill um, ordering it to be, uh, to be checked out. And they uh, sent up a plane um very ancient <laughs> plane um which with a an american receiver in it because we didn't have anything as good as this um <clears throat> at that time in the war and sure enough um they found uh that there were two beams and where they crossed each other that there wasn't a raid going on at that time but there were obviously the germans were setting it up for a raid because the doom beams crossed over Derby, uh, which is where the Spitfire engines uh, were made. <coughs> there are all sorts of stories uh, that you can read about um, the, the work that uh, Harvey Jones did. Um, and I'll um, mention uh, some of the literature, some of the books in a moment. What, another thing that he was uh, looking into was um, the different types of radar that were being used, um, <clears throat> which we didn't understand at the time. Um, they, more and more, uh, they were picking up uh, radar beams coming across, um, which they, they, didn't, they needed to know more about uh, what was sending these beams. Um, so that they could find ways of um, mucking them up um, so that G the Germans wouldn't see, they would be jamming the signals. <coughs> um, these two uh, books are probably the best books around. This is a paperback, uh, one on the left, which is uh, <coughs> available, for, well, they're both available from Amazon, but that's about £15. This one here is about £60, so it's not... Uh, um, not cheap to get hold of. Anyway, um, again, it, they didn't. They, you don't have to have the bits and pieces to pull apart um, before uh, to find out how something works necessarily. You can find out quite a lot by seeing what's uh, what's coming uh, in other by other means. So. Uh, the Würzburg radar, which was uh, the shorter range of radar uh, <coughs> against our, our um, aircraft going over there, um, we could measure the frequency, the pulse length, pulse repetition frequency. It could all be measured from this, this side, um, from our side. But um, unfortunately, uh, we needed more than that to find out what the range was um, and how the, the signal was being used and to reverse engineer it. Uh, fortunately, uh, a, this had been found, uh, this is a, a, one of the, uh, a, one of the uh, photographs from uh, photo reconnaissance. Somebody noticed on, um, at Medmanham, um, which was where all of our uh, analysis of photographs was done during the second world, the aerial ones, they noticed something there, which you can barely see, just there. Um, and what, what, he, what the person who flew by noticed is that when he went in one direction, the shadow, which you can't see on there, was um, slightly different from when he turned around and came back the other way, implying that what it was, whatever it was was moving. And so he went out again, and so they were quite crazy, these pilots, that they would risk doing it. And there in uh, February 42, he got, a, got this picture here. 
and that was not very far from the coast. Um, and that turned out to be, at first they thought very odd, it's sound reflection, reflector, uh, but no, uh, they were sure that's where the signal was coming from. Um, and it was a so-called Würzburg um, radar, um, which is, this is a German photograph of it. And so they set up um, the so-called Bruneval raid or Operation Biting, because it was so near the coast, and uh, they took with them a, um, a, a, I think it was a naval actually, radar technician, um, who was um, very scared. <laughs> so, yeah, but the, uh, lots of soldiers um, were landed by parachute and came in off the coast and up the cliff, um, protecting him uh, while he took bits out of um, <coughs> the radar. And what he didn't realise at the time uh, was that um, if they were going to get caught, they got to shoot him <laughs> because he knew too much. Um, but fortunately, they didn't have to, and it was a very successful raid, and they got back to uh, the UK. So what the technical conclusions were it was uh, because he, they got the right pieces back uh, it was a conventional radar electronic parameters they already knew it was well engineered uh, it was modular easy fault finding and maintenance um, and by looking at such things as the uh, serial numbers on the various bits of it um, they could tell uh, that they were producing about 100 of these units a month um, at the peak. Um, so what they've got is information um, that they found in the UK and derived from the Renovo raid, uh, apart from things like uh, the production numbers and all the rest of it, um, they managed to get work out all these other uh, useful figures to produce a jammer um, that would was uh, very successful. Now this is um, a slightly different example of somebody doing reverse engineering because he wasn't an engineer. Um, this uh, chap um, was in the Navy um, and uh, he was um, <coughs> an officer who had been trained as uh, in the torpedo school, um, which was uh, unusual, really, uh, when you consider um, that he was actually a barrister. Um, and uh, the, they, he was summoned uh, with another man who didn't know what on earth was, what it was all about, summoned secretly um, by... Admiral Wake Walker to go to London to, to see him. Um, and uh, <coughs> the other chap, they, they met up at the station, didn't realise, the railway station, they didn't realise they were both been summoned uh, to see him. The problem was the, there was an influence mine which was <coughs> blowing up lots of our ships, um, in, especially in the port areas. And um, the situation was desperate. And the interesting thing was that there were survivors from all of these uh, sunken ships. Um, when you examined, when they examined the wrecks, the whatever this mine was, wasn't making a hole in the ship. It was just shaking it and rattling it. So the rivets all came apart. And because it then sank slowly, it didn't kill very many uh, naval people. And they could say, uh, tell, uh, you know, there were, there were lots of crew left behind uh, to be able to work out what on earth was going on. And um, when the, uh, uh, this chap, Ash uh, Lincoln, um, was asked why, why he was involved, because he was basically a barrister, He's, the key thing was, you know how to weigh, uh, to weigh witness evidence um, and of course there were a lot of witnesses and there were only two pleased to tell him what was going on um, and 
but fortunately, very soon afterwards, uh, they one of these um, so-called influence mines uh, landed uh, on the beach um, down in the Thames estuary. Um, you can see it, there's water around it, and they they roped it to stop it rolling around if, if the water came in further. Um, and what they considered, it was considered that there must have been a lot of water between the bottom of the ship and this mine, whatever it was, when it blew up. And that's why it sort of rattled the ship rather than blowing a hole in it. But they desperately needed to find out what the influence was. Um, and uh, they are very dangerous, really, because they took this thing apart, not knowing if it was booby traps at all. Um, and th these photographs aren't very good, unfortunately. But it turned out to be an extremely sensitive magnetic device um, that uh, fired it off, <coughs> uh, which only uh, was activated when it was uh, when it had actually sunk through water to a certain level. Um, they, it was booby trapped, but they managed to, to get uh, around it, and it was only being used in estuaries because it couldn't be used in deep water because the, it wouldn't shake the ship enough to, to fall apart. So this was also one of the many uh, triumphs, apart from um, the fact that he was a barrister, not an engineer at all. Uh, he, did, he pulled it apart with, a, with the other chap who was an engineer, uh, but a very risky business. And a lot of these stories um, are available, actually, on... Um, R.V. Jones wrote a wonderful book called Most Secret War. I don't know if anybody's read it, uh, but it's still available from Amazon. Um, that's the cover of a copy that I've had. Um, so this, the um, cover's different on Amazon now. And also, this, there's a series of four uh, DVDs um, which are available, still available, uh, from the BBC, uh, when this chap called William Woolard um, went through a whole series of these uh, things, uh, including um, the radar and all the other stories that, that R.V. Jones was involved with, um, and they're really worthwhile getting a hold of, and they're not, they're not expensive at all. So what, what else happened? Well, there's a B-27 was a magnificent bomber, um, but our friends, the Russians, copied it um, in the middle of the war um, to the extent that uh, they even, uh, not quite sure how they got hold of one of these, it probably uh, crash landed or whatever, but they copied it to the extent that drill holes, which were redundant, which were drilled by mistake in the version of the B-27 that they got hold of, were copied, um, even though they were useless and known to be wrong. Um, and so they produced the TU-4. Well, of course, at this time, we, they were actually on the same side as us. But times have changed. And I found this thing, um, a quotation, February um, last year in the Eurasian Times. Furious Russia blasts China over unauthorized copying of Russian military hardware. What a bloody cheek. <laughs> um, and there were a number of other uh, devices, a number of other uh, things that they, they copied. And uh, for example, a very nice camera there called Contax. Um, here is the Russian version. Absolutely. Identical. Also, Hasselblad, both conventional cameras. These, um, and there's this is the Russian copy over here. Dreadful, and they copied all sorts of other things too. ZX Spectrum, um, Nintendo Game and Watch. They call called it something else. The Ford Prefect. Um, ripped off um, the Hawker Sydney Harrier, they ripped off, um, and uh, they there's uh, 
I can't remember the name of the, um, of the cartoon character that they ripped off as well. But anyway, it, big top, copy items often make, are often um, copied with the mistakes. Uh, when I was with Philips, um, they thought that they'd uh, had a magnificent coup with a very expensive X-ray setup that was um, that they bought that Moscow bought from Philips um, and they, Philips thought you know okay we're on to something here um, uh, very soon they'll be wanting some more and of course they didn't want any more and um, when I've been over I went over to Moscow um, to um, um, international standards junket um, and we went into some hospitals there and lo and behold, a lot of it looked very Phillips. Um, and I'm sure the same situation occurred with screw holes that were not unnecessarily placed. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go into very modern um, things that can be done to reverse engineer electronics, <clears throat> mainly because it's, um, I came out of that era and you can actually um, take uh, integrated circuits apart um, and it's fascinating the way they do it but uh, I don't know enough about it but what I do understand about is the fact that before integrated circuits we were using a lot of printed circuits that have been around for oh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years now um, but the, a lot of the original ones you were quite copy because they were just single-sided. Uh, and then they were double-sided, in other words, circuitry on both sides. But later they were on up to six layers of um, printed circuit uh, and it became much more difficult to try and uh, sort out what on earth was going on. Um, but just briefly, um, this is such a circuit which had about uh, three layers. Um, there are a number of things that you could do to, uh, to get at the circuitry, but it took a very long time to do. Um, obviously, with the cruder ones, you could sandpaper. If you look on the, these things, it tells you which are easy to do, which give the best results <coughs> uh, and are the cheapest and quickest. Uh, that's taking the solder mask off the top half and the bottom here it's delayering it where you're taking off uh, layer by layer by sanding it off extremely carefully um, preferably with surface grinding um, because you can do that extremely accurately uh, but um, latterly uh, another technique has become available uh, which is copied from the medical world and that's either x-raying, which was 2D, two-dimensional, it isn't that brilliant, but computer, computerized tomography um, can do it reasonably well layer by layer. And not that it's a similar machine to that's used medically, uh, but it has to be, have much more precision uh, to uh, separate each layer because there are only a few hundredths of a, or hundredths or so of a millimeter. Um, <clears throat> in thickness. So it, reverse engineering is a huge subject um, and so I haven't covered uh, software and firmware hacking because uh, I, I haven't got the time and also I think it's uh, rather it's very unethical most of it. Another big subject um, is uh, material science um, which uh, it's not just you need how, how what it is, but you need how strong the materials are and also the manufacturing techniques. And I haven't covered uh, in any depth the ethics and morality of the situation. Lastly, there's just two, this, this is the main book, if you want to go into this more deeply, um, this book is absolutely superb. Um, and with it, I've worked with uh, industrial archaeology, um, archaeology, which is uh, also a very good introduction. 
Um, and so is this uh, dictionary, Industrial Archaeology, which unfortunately is out of print. Um, but <coughs> copies of it are available from um, the usual sources, not Amazon, but uh, the usual sources of older books. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>